great uh, to be together. And this is the last time that we are meeting for module number one. And as is our custom, I want to share with you something from uh, the Word of God. And tonight it comes from Acts chapter 8. The story is of the spreading of the gospel. And uh, we have Philip, one of the so-called deacons. He's not called a deacon, not here, but we suspect that later on uh, he was one of the deacons or that that was the first uh, appointment of deacons. Uh, But an angel of the Lord appeared to him and told him to go down and uh, meet someone on the way to Gaza. And uh, he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian. This is in Acts chapter 8, and I'm reading from 26, and I'm just summarizing the story. Um, And then we'll we'll break in at uh, verse uh, 30. The man uh, came from Ethiopia. He's adopted Judaism as his religion. Um, We're not sure exactly how and why, it's quite interesting, I uh, got stuck in Ethiopia uh, just last year for a 26-hour period, missing a connecting flight to Thailand, and um, asking um, a guide, a, a taxi man, the next day to take us around in the city of Addis Ababa. And it's amazing how much uh, tradition there is in terms of Old Testament, uh, Judaism, and some mixture of Christianity and Judaism and Orthodoxy, and Coptic church and everything else is there in Ethiopia. Some Ethiopians even till today believe that the Ark of the Covenant ended up in Ethiopia and it's stuck away somewhere in a little church or a little building somewhere and they won't allow anybody to get close to that. So it's a very, very interesting country, but it really goes back to the time before Christ. Somehow or the other, Jews must have traveled in the northern parts of Africa and they have taken the concept of Judaism with them. Some of you may remember even in more modern times, it's at one stage, uh, Israel went in and evacuated or helped many Ethiopian Jews to actually go to Israel. And today, they, many of them live in Israel. And they are li- literally Jews, but they are black African, uh, but they have adopted Judaism and they are regarded as Jews. And many of them live in Israel now. In Acts chapter 8, we have Philip uh, meeting an Ethiopian. He was part of the court of the queen, and he went to Jerusalem to worship. And he was on his way back, and he was reading. Philip ran up to the chariot when the Spirit of the Lord told him to go to the chariot. In verse 30 of Acts chapter 8, Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. Now that's a question that I want to ask you tonight and to consider that question. Do you understand what you are reading? And that's really the topic of our lecture time together. Do you understand what you are reading? There's so much in the Bible, as I will point out later on, that is immediately available to us, understandable, Um, we, we can take it, we can apply it to our own lives, especially the plan of salvation. You can virtually give the Bible to anybody with almost no background and somehow the Holy Spirit will illumine their minds is the word we use uh, through illumination, through the the light shining in their hearts and in in their minds. They will read and something in the Word of God will speak to them, will appeal to them and the Holy Spirit will use those words to help them uh, to, to come to God and to find salvation in God. But at the same time, it is also true, like the Ethiopian, where you may be reading and reading and not necessarily understand exactly everything that is mentioned in the Bible. And that is what we are going to talk about tonight. Now, the Ethiopian responded in verse 31 saying, How can I, unless someone explains it to me? Unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of Scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Again, one of those questions of interpretation. There it is. It's clear. 
in terms of the actual writing, but what does it actually mean? And how do we interpret this particular passage? Essentially what the eunuch is asking Philip. Then Philip began with, what, with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Cut that story short, the eunuch came to know the Lord. He was baptized and he went home with joy. And he is probably the first missionary to Africa, uh, although there may have been others on the day of Pentecost who went to Egypt and Alexandria and other places in the northern parts of, of Africa. But many of those would have been Jews. Here we have um, a true Gentile who adopted Judaism as, re as his religion. And now he became a Christian and he went back to his home. And he probably shared his faith with other people around. But that question is an important one. And that is, who will explain to us? And there are two things that I want to say about that. The first is that we need to be dependent on the actual reading of the words in the Bible to inform us. And this, this, is, this is written for us. And, and what we need to do is to read it and then to adopt it and to interpret that. But on the other hand, we are totally dependent on the Holy Spirit to dwell within us and to illumine our minds, to help us to understand what it is that God is saying to us. So let's continue to read and let's continue to ask the Holy Spirit to help us and guide us in our interpretation. But also as we read and as we depend on the Holy Spirit, we need some guidelines. And that's the topic of our discussion tonight. So let's pray together as we uh, get going. Father, we want to thank you for another opportunity to learn, to study, and to learn more about your word, the Bible. And I pray that as we discover more about the truths in your word and about your word, Lord, that you would help us to love you more as a result of that. I pray that you would work deeply in our hearts and that your name be glorified in everything we do. We thank you for this time together during this module. We thank you that tonight we come to the end of module number one. Thank you, Lord, that you have kept us faithful. Thank you for all that we were able to share and learn together. And I pray that as a result of what we have learned, we will not only know your word, the Bible, better, but that we will get to know you better, that we will love you more, and that we will be far more effective in serving you in this world where you have placed us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we check in tonight, I want to congratulate you for hanging in there uh, for eight weeks. This is week number eight, and thank you for coming in the first instance, and thank you for signing up for this course. And uh, thank you for learning and, and listening with uh, attention. Um, I think during the eight weeks, most of you listened with attention, and I want to thank you for that. I really appreciate that. You have reached the end of module number one, and uh, tonight, uh, sometime or the other, during the course of, of the lecture time or during the break, uh, we just ask you to complete the, the evaluation form, the feedback form, so that you can give us feedback. It really helps to get the feedback in order to plan better for the next time that we do this again. And today's lecture is a bit shorter. Uh, as I have mentioned to you last week, uh, after uh, the tea break, then uh, some of you are going to come back and write the exam. Uh, the rest of you will be free to go. Now, so far, I trust that you know the books the names of the books of the Bible, all 66 of them. I'm not going to ask you to write them out again tonight, um, but those of you who are registered for the certificate of completion, that's going to be in your exam. So if you haven't memorized them, you've got time now very quickly to memorize some of those. I also trust that you have a better insight into this book that we call the Bible. Um, I, I, I love the Lord. I love His Word. And the, the way that I get to know God is through this Bible. And what I've tried to do during the whole course is to give you more confidence that this book is the truth, that we find the truth of God in this book. This book is about uh, the living word, Jesus Christ, ultimately, because Jesus is God's plan uh, for salvation. And I trust that your con confidence has been... Um, been increasing over time as you learn more uh, about the Bible. We have learned that the Bible is God's inspired word. It was written by many authors using different genres, as we have seen in lecture number one. Uh, 
Uh, it was transmitted by careful copying and checking. Uh, that, that process is an open process that is there for any scientist to follow. Uh, and you can read up more on that uh, as well as, we, as you uh, use the method called textual criticism. It's been translated for us to read in our own language and to understand. It's accessible to all who wish to know God. And at the end of this module, my question to you really is this. Do you read your Bible? I trust you read it with more insight. I trust that you now have some tools that you can now use in order to read the Bible more effectively. But the question is, are you reading it? It's one thing to know about the Bible. It's another thing to actually use it uh, in your life. And by way of personal testimony, I, I, I honestly try hard to read the Bible every single day. Uh, there are times when I skip it, uh, and I'm not going to beat myself up and feel uh, guilty for the rest of the day or for weeks long. Uh, it's just one of those things, when it happens, it happens, or when, it not, when it's not happening, it doesn't happen. But it is in the, the important thing to discipline yourself and to read it. And my suggestion is that you read it systematically. And I have put together a little document, a little booklet, which you have as, as a document, just to help you understand how you can better read the Bible and uh, use that, the dif different ways of reading the Bible systematically. And I think that's one of the key words is to read it systematically. Uh, there's nothing wrong in opening the Bible on one day or having a little promise box or maybe uh, one of these things that's sort of um, sent to you via an SMS with a verse. Uh, I just hate to pay five rand for an SMS uh, on my phone when I have everything right here uh, in my hand and I can even download the whole Bible on my cell phone. So why would I pay five rand a day for someone to send me a little verse of Scripture? But the important thing that I want to highlight is that you read your Bible um, and that you continue to read it and read it systematically. Uh, even if you start with a five-minute slot or a three-minute slot, uh, some people actually set the target so high they want to spend an hour a day in the Bible, and they, they never get there, and therefore they just give up. And so my encouragement is, forget the hour, just do a five minute, just do a two minute, and then as you get into the Word of God, increase that. Rather than start big, start small and increase it. Um, and, and therefore, and in that way, you will be encouraged uh, if you read the Bible and continue to do so. The topic of tonight, if you are reading in either Johnston or Harris, the page numbers is, uh, are in your notes. Uh, in the New Bible Dictionary, I've referred to this already last week, but the two words that you will find there, one is, is hermeneutics and the other one is interpretation, and I will be uh, talking about those words in just a moment. Some of the questions of Bible interpretation. How can I understand the meaning of the Bible and how can I properly and responsibly interpret the Bible? I've said to you earlier on, it is true that the Bible is fairly simple. I can read it. There's enough in the Bible that I can read and understand and understand God's ways and understand God's uh, way of salvation, na namely Jesus Christ. But the, it's also true that there are many passages in the Bible that, that call for a deeper level of understanding and interpretation. And tonight we're going to talk about some of those rules of interpretation. And once I have interpreted a particular passage then how do I know that my interpretation is actually correct? What if I read the Bible, I study the Bible, um, and I'm in a passage and I come up with a, a wonderful idea. Maybe it's a wild idea. Nobody in 2,000 years ever thought about that particular interpretation. Well, you're probably wrong because in 2,000 years, nobody is going to come up with something brand new. However, um, we in, in our interpretation, if a wild idea grabs me, then the next step for me is to go and talk to someone, read up on the, in the commentators or commentaries, and to see if my interpretation is in line with other people's interpretations as well. And how do I check my understanding of the Bible? So tonight we'll talk about responsible interpretation of the Bible. The challenge of interpretation is, is rather big. We, we want to base our beliefs and our practices on the Bible, but do we understand it correctly? Um, and the very fact that we have many different church traditions, we call them denominations, uh, must give you an idea that people interpret the Bible differently. They differ on many different issues, whether it is church government or governance and, or baptism or the way of salvation or the precise way in which it works. 
um, election or non-election or the free will of mankind. Uh, there's a whole range of topics uh, that people disagree on. And everybody is using the exact same Bible. So to simply say to a person, well, it's in the Bible, you just go and read it for yourself, uh, doesn't seem uh, to, to necessarily resolve the issue. Of course it's in the Bible. But the concept baptism is in the Bible, and yet people hold different views around the time, the mode of baptism uh, because of their interpretation of the Bible. And so the reality is that there is a big gap between our time, the 21st century, and the time when the Bible was written. We now know that it was finalized about 100 AD, and uh, the canon was finalized another a century or so, two centuries later. But over a period of 1,500 years, the Bible was put together in terms of different authors writing it. And, and since it was completed in terms of the canon that we have, uh, people have been interpreting the Bible in different ways over a long period of time. And time moves on. And the further you, you move away from the original, the more difficult it is to actually understand what those people have said or what they have meant when they wrote the Bible in the first instance or the books in the Bible. And it all relates to the communication process that most of us are probably fairly familiar with. There are difficulties in any communication. Uh, if you are married, you will know that it's difficult to communicate because a woman thinks differently from a man. There is just no doubt about that. And so when I have something in my mind and I say it and Joan receives it and she interprets what I'm saying, she may get all upset before actually checking with, with me, what did you actually mean by that? Now, I wish I could go to the Apostle Paul, sometimes literally shake him by the shoulders and say, what did you mean by this? Why did you write this, that, or the other? Because now the churches all over the world disagree with one another, or Christians disagree with one another, because they interpret it differently. It is very clear Paul had one single thing in his mind. His intention was, the meaning was, X. Now we live 2,000 years later, we need to try and communicate with with him, and we can't. We, we only have the product on, in, um, in the Bible he's writing. So from the author, when Paul wrote it, he had something in his mind. He wrote it down that we call the process of encoding. Um, so he put it into word forms. In his particular case, it was Greek. And he wrote it to an original um, reader or audience. Now we have clear indication, even in Thessalonians, the two books of Thessalonians, that even the Thessalonians often, or some of the first recipients often misunderstood what Paul was saying. Both in the two letters of Thessalonians, where Paul needed to write a second letter to try and explain what he meant in the first letter, because he didn't actually expand that much on the topic of the second coming, for example. We also have evidence in the books of Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And if you stick around long enough and you're in the third module, we'll look at the whole process, the back and forth communication between Paul and the church in Corinth. But in, in those two letters, it is very, very clear that Paul was, was grossly misunderstood somewhere along the line, either in verbal communication or in writing. Hence, uh, several back and forth uh, type co ways of communication, visits, and then the two letters that we have in our New Testament, the second one in particular indicating that they have misunderstood him and he needed to make a correction. Now, if that is true, that Paul needed to bridge the gap between what he wrote down and what they eventually read, maybe uh, several or, or hundreds of miles away in another city or another continent even, um, with all the disturbances of communication in, in between, then it is even more true for us today. Because from the author to the original reader to the contemporary reader, which is, which is me, you and I, with even more disturbances. Now, we, we are not privy to Greek directly, and certainly not New Testament Greek. We need to go and study that and unravel that, then translate that into our language. And we're not there to go and check with them to say, what exactly does this Greek word mean? We now have to look at all the resources available to us 2,000 years later to try and find that out. And the, the gap is ever more increasing. Uh, 
from the author to the reader with the disturbances um, in the meantime. And those disturbances can be anything. We're not just, sometimes communicators in communication theory, they talk about noise. There is noise. Uh, it's like a telephone line, and I'm on this line, and you're on the other line, and there's noise in between, and therefore I don't hear precisely what you are saying. That's the disturbances that we're talking about. Now, noise can be language difficulties, cultural differences, um, and even uh, gender differences, the way a man thinks and the way a woman thinks, and the list goes on and on in terms of the kind of disturbances that one may have in communication. Let me give you an illustration. I think most of us in South Africa will understand um, this kind of illustration. There's several SMSs and, and emails, actually, that have gone around in the last few weeks about uh, Bucky's Buta. Now, any communication assumes a huge amount of common knowledge. Uh, it's also referred to as context. Uh, it can be any kind of context. In the Bible, we talk about written context because that's the only form of communication we have. But in, in, a, uh, in a setting like this, we're talking about a particular context. Right now, I am talking to you. You are listening to me. This is a lecture-type style. And, and everybody knows that there are certain conditions for our communication right now to actually work well or not. But here is a typical scenario around a braai in South Africa. The setting is a braai. The atmosphere is relaxed. It's not a lecture. Uh, the language is South African. It can be, in our case, English. The conversation goes something like, Bucky's Buta walks into a bar and he says, Hey, but I am going to club you. Now, if you have an American or an Australian or some other person standing in that circle the person will probably be lost. Why? Because there's a huge amount of assumption going into what I have just written on the screen, and, and uh, that's, the, uh, that, that's the end of the story. I just want to introduce that to you. Let's look at the assumptions of that illustration. Number one, it's a joke. Now, that's a genre. We talked about genre in the Bible. And here, in language, and you don't even know it, more often you don't, but when you tell a joke, then you don't go into the detail. You don't have to explain the detail. In fact, the biggest joke killer is when your wife says to you, what do you mean? You've lost it. When, when that happens, the joke is gone. Because the moment you have to try and explain a joke, the joke is no more. It, it is the punchline, it's, it's the, the whole setting, the whole context, the whole genre is assuming that this is a joke. And therefore, you don't take it seriously. Now, the next thing, the person may say, now, now when did Bucky's Buddha go into the bar? You've lost it, because it's not the point. He hasn't gone into a bar, maybe he does, but he hasn't. That's not the point. The point is, yeah, we're telling a joke, it's a particular genre. It doesn't need any specifics. A braai, I mean, even the word braai in English in South Africa de demands a particular context. It demands a South African context because if you use this same word in an English conversation in America, people will be completely lost. You will have to replace it with something else. Bucky's Buerta. I mean, again, you go to the States, you use this illustration from a pulpit or around a barbecue or a cookout, which is the words they use uh, in America, they will be lost. They have zero idea. They don't know rugby. Uh, they're the poorer for it, but they don't know rugby at all. Um, and, and here you have a big South African rugby player and, and, and certain assumptions, rugby, uh, big, strong, not to be messed around, those things are not mentioned in the joke. The very word Bakis Buta, and I, I don't know whether you've received that email just recently, but it says uh, it has a whole list of things about Bakis Buta and he's strong. Uh, when I was growing up, there were others. There was uh, Fana Merva, and then there was uh, Willemann van Kalahari, and there were all sorts of, you know, it was a joke and a story about big men, and you don't mess around with them. That, that's the point of that whole story. And then, hey, But. Now, But, again, you will have to explain to a non South African and probably to some South Africans as well. But it is an Afrikaans word that means a brother, but it's a sort of a colloquial, uh, fun uh, name that you, that you call someone you really like sort of thing. Or um, in, a, in a context like this, uh, 
uh, it, it can mean maybe something negative or whatever. But it, it really goes back to a TV con commercial some years ago about some oil, and there was a whole series of them where the two men sat in front of a garage and they chatted to one another, uh, and, and the word just became part of the expression. Uh, even in English, but uh, is a word that we use in that way. Uh, and it, it, it originated with, as I said, a brother, a bro, uh, or whatever other word, but but is something that people in South Africa, I think, understand. And then club, another word that uh, oftentimes English-speaking people use around uh, in South Africa, but again, you would have to explain that if you are talking, uh, if you're using this illustration in a setting that is non-South Africa or South African. Now, all of that, just to introduce to you the challenge of communication, having the Bible uh, written 2,000 years ago, and we are now reading it, and it means that we don't necessarily understand everything at first sight. It leads us to the term hermeneutics. The word is derived from the Greek hermeneuo, uh, which can be translated to interpret or to explain. And so the word hermeneutics is used in many different um, disciplines, not only in the Bible or biblical disciplines or in theology, but in any, anything that you need to try and explain uh, or, or, or you need to use certain rules to explain it in law, uh, legal terms, and everything else. Uh, sometimes you need to interpret what a judge has said in terms of uh, a court uh, order or whatever. The word is used to denote Number A, the study and statement of the principles on which a text is to be understood. Or B, the interpretation of the text in such a way that its meaning comes home to the reader or to the hearer. And tonight I'm going to talk about both of those. We talk about meaning, but we also talk about the principles that we apply in order to understand the Bible better. And this is a quote from the Bible uh, Dictionary. Some of the common terms that you will find uh, in this whole study of hermeneutics. Um, as I said, the word hermeneutics itself means the rules of interpretation. The word exegesis you may or may not have heard before, but the word really means to interpret or to discover the, and explain the meaning of a text. And oftentimes a preacher will say, when I was doing my exegesis of a passage, he, what he really means is I was studying it and I was trying to unfold the meaning of that text. I was digging deeper in order to understand what it, what it says. The opposite to that is eisegesis, whereas exegesis, the word ex in Greek means out of, to, to take out of the text what it means. Eisegesis, the word ace in Greek really means into, and that is to read into the text what I want it to say. Uh, oftentimes I do that with my wife. I read into what she says to me, what I want her to say, what I want to hear. And there's a real danger that we do that with the Scripture. So this is a dangerous word where we actually read into the Scriptures. Already I come to the Scriptures with an idea, a preconceived idea, and I want to read into that text uh, what it says. Exposition is an explaining or the explaining of the meaning of the text. Uh, and, and really, it, the word is exposing. Uh, you can see the word there. Let, let's take a text, as it were. Let's expose it. Let's uh, uh, use an exposition of the Scripture. It is in this context that you will hear from time to time people talk about expositional preaching. Um, we use expositional preaching, which means the sermon is not an idea where you just add on certain verses to prove your idea, but it is taking a text of Scripture and allowing the text to speak um, and, and to, uh, to unfold the text, to expose the text, and allow the text to actually speak uh, into a particular situation. The word application, I think, is pretty clear. It is making an application to a modern-day situation. Once I know what the Bible says... Uh, or what it said in the past, then the next step is, what does it say to me? In other words, what is a, a modern or a contemporary application uh, of that? And this is the task of hermeneutics. Bible interpretation has two main tasks. The one is, and you, this is very easy to remember, uh, in the words, what, does the Bible, what did the Bible say? Uh, 
or it seeks to understand what was said by the author in the past tense. In other words, I open up in Romans or Corinthians or wherever. My first question is, what did Paul write? Or what did Moses say, let's say in Genesis or Exodus or wherever? What did the Bible say back then? That's the first task. What did it mean to the original reader, readers, uh, author and readers? The second question that I then ask is, what does it say? What is it saying to me today? And, and both of those are important. We do not want to simply stop with, what does the Bible, what did the Bible say? What did the author mean? We want to take it through and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? And that's the task of hermeneutics, exegesis, and ultimately preaching, uh, is to to not only expose what the original author said, but also what the Lord is saying to us right now. That is modern-day application. In terms of the history of, of hermeneutics, um, this is a semester-long course, and so I'm going to condense it into one single slide and just give you uh, a little bit of information about that. There are different ways in which the church over time interpreted the Bible, or different rules or different methods of interpretation perhaps, the first one that became very popular in uh, the first few hundred years after um, the early church, I would say, is called the allegorical interpretation. Allo allegorical interpretation, we'll look at a few of those examples later on, but it always asks the question, what is the deeper meaning behind the surface of the words? When, when the word door is mentioned in the Bible, certainly the Bible cannot be so human as to only use the word door. There must be something more about that. The, the very fact that the Song of Songs in the Old Testament had difficulty entering into the canon was precisely this issue. Because Song of Songs is rather erotic in the style, language, and vocabulary. It's, um, it talks about this lover uh, and, and, his, uh, and his bride uh, or girl. And um, the, the Jews struggled with that, and so did early Christianity. And therefore, they took it one step further and said, okay, well, maybe that is the surface meaning. Uh, you're talking about a lover and, or two lovers, but, but surely there must be something deeper here because it cannot be that shallow as it were. And so the allegorical interpretation of Song of Songs says uh, this is not just two lovers, but this is... God loving Israel, and later on God or Jesus loving the church. And so it's a deeper reading of the text. I'm just going to stop there for now. The grammatical historical interpretation says that the clear language, the grammar, and the historical situation should guide the interpretation. In other words, we need to look at the grammar and the language that is used, and uh, obviously we're using the English, and so we, we depend on those who have done a proper Greek or Hebrew translation of the Bible for us. There is also a historical context that we cannot deny. Historical language, historical uh, habits and cultural practices and everything else. So the grammatical historical approach is almost the exact opposite to that of the allegorical. And over time, the church has tended to land here, rather than with the allegorical, it was saying we don't have to always look for a deeper meaning. We can take the meaning, the surface meaning, as long as you read it grammatically, historically, uh, in the context of the language and the history of Israel and the early church. Another thing, and I'm not going to elaborate at all, uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, there are plenty of books on this particular uh, topic, but form criticism. And it says that the form of the text determines uh, the meaning, and therefore uh, this has ultimately led to some more liberal views of the scriptures, um, especially looking at form and how the form has changed over time and so on. I don't want to elaborate too much on that. Uh, there, is, uh, there was actually in more recent times a development which said, um, that we need to look at how readers respond to the Word of God. And that is, the Word of God is not objective Word of God. It only becomes the Word of God the way I read it. And when it speaks to me, then it is the Word of God. Uh, of those four, the grammatical historical one is the one that, that we end up supporting because any of the others ultimately take away from the Word of God and the natural reading uh, of the Word of God. 
And this is our preference, as I said, with, without denying the difficulty at times to understand and interpret Bible passages. Our preference is to take the text at face value. In other words, I read it and I take the, the natural, simple, straightforward meaning that, that I find in the text. It is true that there are times when I do not understand what I'm reading, and therefore we're going to look at some rules of interpretation a bit later on. And this means that our interpretation will lean towards the grammatical, historical approach to the Bible. It is ultimately, in my opinion, the most objective of the views, um, and, and uh, nobody can claim objectivity completely. Uh, I have grown up in a particular church tradition personally. My dad was a pastor, so my, I, I was set in a certain way. I, I was almost programmed in a certain way in terms of reading the Bible. It's very difficult for me to divorce myself of my own history, my upbringing, uh, my particular views, uh, and as I go to the Bible, I often read the Bible against my own background. In other words, I'm not entirely objective. I try hard to be as objective as possible, but it's never possible for anybody to be objective. And therefore, my approach as a, a white, western-minded South African will be different to a black African living in Nigeria, when, when both of us read the Bible. Ultimately, generally speaking, the, the interpretation will be the same, but there will be differences of opinion. On the issue of baptism, uh, again, I grew up in a particular tradition. Uh, when I speak to someone who grew up in a different tradition, we're at loggerheads, we, we can smile and argue the case, but we may have differences of opinion about that because our, our background and our subjectivity sometimes determines how we read the Bible. However, our, our uh, goal is to be as objective as possible, to say, Lord, this is your word, speak to me and allow your word to address me. By way of conclusion, um, just on this first part of the lecture. The Bible can be read and understood in, in its essential message, and that is God's eternal salvation plan. Some Bible passages are not immediately clear, and they need some interpretation, and we need some rules of interpretation to guide us as we seek to unfold uh, the meaning of the Bible. Now, with that, we come to the, first, uh, to the end of the first half of our lecture time uh, tonight. Okay, welcome back to the second half of our time together, and we're going to look at some of the guidelines for interpreting the Bible. Rules of hermeneutics, and I'm going to add a couple of examples. I wish we had more and more time to look at plenty of examples, but I'm going to use one example. I'm going to give you some rules of interpretation, and then look at a few of the examples. Well, actually one or two examples per rule, just to, to uh, illustrate uh, what it is that I mean. The first rule, the first principle that we apply has to do with whether we interpret a passage in the Bible literally or figuratively. And the more literal and natural reading of a text is to be preferred, with obvious exceptions such as the many, many of the pictures in the book of Revelation, some of the images. Now, when in the book of Revelation there is mention of a woman who sits on seven hills, then it is fairly obvious that we're not talking about a literal interpretation. You have to then interpret that figuratively. Uh, the dragons, the, the many heads, um, the, there are many of those images in the book of, of Revelation. In fact, scholars disagree as to how far you go with literal and how far you go with figurative interpretation of the book of Revelation. Uh, but that is a topic on its own. When, however you get to the book of Matthew, and it says um, in Matthew chapter 2, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the, the one who has been born King of the Jews? I don't have to wonder, what's the deeper meaning here? Uh, is there a figurative meaning? Uh, are we talking about Herod, or is there some, something behind? No, I don't have to worry about that, because that is clear. We're talking about a pure historical incidence. The language is clear, and we don't have to then further scratch our heads to find out, is this figurative or literal? It is as literal as you can get it. Uh, so most of the scriptures can be interpreted like that. 
Also given the fact that, and I'll get to that point, that there are different genres in the Bible, and this is why the book of Revelation is in a genre of its own. It is in a literature type of its own, and therefore there are certain rules that apply to the book of Revelation, uh, and as much as the uh, different rules apply to different genres as well. The figurative, such as the allegorical interpretation, is to be avoided unless the text demands it. And there may be a couple of places where the, the Bible, the, the, the clear meaning is that there is an allegorical meaning behind this. Uh, but then the Bible will have to say that. The, the danger, and as I will point out later on, the danger with allegorical interpretation or figurative interpretation is that you and I, and, and there are uh, maybe about 80 or 70 or 80 of us here uh, in this room, we, we can have 70 or 80 different interpretations because each one of us can just apply an interpretation to the Bible, which makes it very clear. But when I read about Magi coming to Bethlehem, which is a, uh, a known city, Herod, who is a known person who was born, uh, or Jesus born during his time, uh, we, we don't have to disagree on that because the historical information uh, is right there. Our first attempt, therefore, should be to allow for a literal interpretation as far as possible, such as the grammatical historical approach, the clear and the obvious meaning based on the language, the grammar, the background of the text is to be preferred. Now, here is an example in Second Kings, and I, this is not uh, something that I have uh, sucked out of my thumb. This is an actual sermon that I listened to when I was uh, much younger than I am right now. But in 2 Kings chapter 6, and I was already studying theology, so I had an idea what was going on at that particular time. The company of the prophets said to Elisha, Elisha the prophet, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, where each of us can get a pole, and let us build a place there for us to live. And he said, Go. Then one of them said, Won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied, and he went with them. They went to the Jordan, began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. The man of God asked, where did, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. And then the man reached out his hand and took it. And here's the sermon. It was an allegorical interpretation. In other words, the person simply ignored the historical background and the story and simply added meaning to every single little thing in the text, such as the prophets, the company of the prophets, this is the church. Um, they said they needed a bigger place and, and, and the Lord wants us to expand. And they, they said, um, Elisha said, okay, go and, and cut some wood. They said, no, you must come with us. Clearly, they were inviting the Holy Spirit to come with him. We never can go anywhere without the Holy Spirit. And then the man was, was heating away and, and the axe fell off. In fact, he was, and this is a sermon, I, I kid you not. The man was chopping away, but there was no axe head. He was actually working without power. He was working without the power of the Holy Spirit. And then um, he called to Elisha to help him and Elisha threw a stick on the water. The cross of Jesus is the one that can save us, uh, that will bring our power back. Now, I have never heard as much rubbish as that. Because that is total rubbish. The, the, it does not appear in the text. The very clear, obvious reading of the story is simply Elisha going with the prophets. They needed a bigger place. The natural reading is there's a story. We need to read the story. The miracle that Elisha performed under God's guidance is there. And let's preach about that. Now, if you want to preach about the power of the Holy Spirit, rather go to a passage where it talks about the power of the Holy Spirit. And so you need, whenever you hear either stories along this or sermons along this line, just run. Because you, th there's, no, there's no limit to the, it's, to the interpretations that can come from a passage like that. It sounds extremely clever, and that's exactly what it is. It sounds clever, but it's not true to the Word of God. And so my encouragement to you is stay with the literal interpretation as far as you possibly can. The second thing I want to say to you is the importance of language. Uh, we talked about language as a context as well, a historical context and the language context. 
Interpreting the Bible is not limited to those who can read the Bible in the original languages, but it does help to have a bit of, of a background. And if you do not have that knowledge of Greek or Hebrew, then one of the best things you can do is to check with those who do have that. If you do come to a very difficult passage that needs to be interpreted, some knowledge of how the Greek and the Hebrew languages are structured and operate can assist in a better understanding. Um, one of the things that really helps in this regard is when, as I said last week, when you read the Bible in different translations, because then you begin to pick up a feel for how different translators and interpreters have interpreted a particular passage or a word. If you cannot read the, these languages, it's best to rely, uh, if, if you do serious Bible study, on the more literal translations uh, of the Bible for your exegesis or for your interpretation. And commentaries are great helps. Um, and I would encourage you to have a single volume commentary. Uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're doing some serious Bible study, at least you can check your, uh, your Bible interpretations against what other people are saying. Uh, one such a, a, a commentary can be the ESV Study Bible, for example, where you have the commentary at the bottom of the page and it can give you the guidance uh, that you need. Let me give you an example of the use of language. When Paul introduces himself as a slave of Jesus Christ in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, the passage that we looked at last week, you, you may remember that, and also he repeats that in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. The word that he uses for a slave is the word doulos. Some of you will recognize the word. It's the Greek word. And it can be translated as either servant or slave. And there's a difference. They, they're similar in a range of meaning because a servant or a slave is someone who serves a master. But there's a difference in ownership. A slave is totally owned by and has therefore no rights of his own, as, as in Paul's case. And so when we translate, we need to then opt for one of these words, because both of those words can be used to translate the Greek word doulos. And a study of servanthood in the Old Testament and New Testament times, and a study of slavery may assist you greatly, not only in terms of the actual language, but in terms of historical background, to understand what the Apostle Paul is saying over here. A slave in those days had zero rights. You were totally owned by the master. And therefore, when Paul calls himself a slave, a doulos of Jesus Christ, he said, I have resigned myself to Jesus. I do not own myself. He confirms it in many other places and ways when he talks about, I have been crucified with Christ. I don't live anymore. He lives in me. And therefore, when, when Jesus said to Paul, go, he goes. And when he called Paul, Paul responded because he knew that he was a slave. There is an interesting a uh, passage in Matthew chapter 15, uh, which I don't have time to elaborate uh, tonight, and I'm not here to do all of the interpretation uh, in this particular lecture time, but let me just refer you to that. It's a story of a woman, a Canaanite woman, who came to Jesus and asked him uh, to heal her daughter. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer her word. So the, the, his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it's not, good, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. Only twice in the New Testament Jesus said to anybody that you have great faith. This woman and a Roman, never to a Jew, which is quite interesting. It's quite phenomenal when you come to think of it. Now, the one thing that you will not find in the NIV, I mean, it's a strange story, but three times... In the Greek, there's a little word, we call it a particle, a little particle word used where Jesus did the opposite to what one expects him, what you would expect him to do. A woman comes to him, it's a normal request, plenty of other people came to Jesus and they asked for healing or 
um, su uh, supply or, or touch or prayer or whatever, and Jesus normally responded to them. Here comes a woman, and she is a Gentile woman, and she comes to Jesus with a request that her daughter be healed, and Jesus doesn't even answer her. Now, there's a little Greek word that says, but. But Jesus did not answer her a word. The disciples even come because she persists. It seems like she's crying out there in the background, sort of following them. And again, uh, the, the disciples come and they say, Lord, send her away, she's irritating us. And again, the little word is used, but. But Jesus said to them, I have only come for the lost sheep of Israel. Now the woman comes and she falls down before Jesus and she says, please, Lord, help me. And again, that little word is used, but. And, and three times in the text, the, the word is used. Every time it indicates an opposite response to what you expect, what you would expect Jesus to do. And, and it was only in verse 28, once the woman says to him, Lord, um, in fact, Jesus says to her, you know, it's not good to take the bread and give it to the dogs. He's calling her a dog. I mean, that's literally what he's doing. Uh, you're a dog. I'm not going to give you the, uh, the food. But, but Jesus had a plan. And the plan comes to the fore in verse 28. And there's a different word used in Greek. when in, Now it's translated in the NIV correctly. And it says, then Jesus answered. It's almost like the key to the passage is the unfolding of the story. It was only then that Jesus said, um, it's almost for the disciples' benefit. Do, do, did you hear this? Do you see a Gentile woman persisting in faith even when I treated her like a dog? And she's coming back. Now she's crawling to me to come and ask for only the crumbs. I would be satisfied if only you give me the crumbs. And then the passage unfolds. It's almost like the key. Then Jesus says. Now, unfortunately, the NIV hasn't translated those little buts because it, it brings the tension in the passage. We see it there because we see a different response uh, of Jesus. But, but the Greek really beautifully illustrates that. Now, I can't expect you to go and read the Greek, but the point I'm trying to make is that oftentimes only a deeper study of a passage will, will bring that uh, to the fore. The third principle I want to highlight is understanding genre. We've talked about this. The Bucky's Buddha joke uh, is a good illustration of how a particular genre uh, calls for a particular invitation uh, or understanding. In the Bible, we have main and sub-genres. We have history, and history such as the Elisha story, we read as history. Now, we interpret that there's a message in it. Um, and the message has to do with God's provision for the prophets, God's miracle working th uh, power through Elisha, and, and many other things that I would probably extract from the passage but definitely not the behind the words, behind the actual things uh, that, that I have mentioned before in allegorical. There is poetry. Now, poetry needs a very different approach because poetry, you have uh, issues such as you have learned in school, uh, poetic freedom, for example. You can't necessarily always interpret everything completely literally because poets use freedom of expression. They are sometimes, you see it in hymns that we, that we sing, oftentimes they even switch words around, which you never do in normal speech, but they have the freedom to do that for rhythm, for rhyme, and for other purposes uh, as well. Parables, and I'll talk more about parables in a moment. There are sayings, there are, there's apocalyptic material, such as the book of Revelation. There are proverbs. Uh, so there are plenty of different genres in the Bible. The, the key is, and we don't have time to elaborate on every single one of these, but the key is that you need to understand that different genres call for different uh, approaches in terms of the interpretation. The genre determines how literal we will take a statement or how we should approach a particular word, a text, or an expression. The best illustration that I can give in a, in a, a few short sentences is that of a parable. A parable normally highlights a spiritual lesson by using an everyday story. There is the parable of the sower, the, the picture on the screen behind there. Uh, the sower goes out and he sows. Now, what happens with the parables is most of them are not interpreted by Jesus. But a few of them are actually interpreted. And when, it, when they are interpreted, uh, 
we then need to stick to Jesus' interp interpretation of that parable. We can't go beyond that. Because in this case, the sower has been interpreted by Jesus. Later on, the disciples came to Jesus and said, what does this actually mean? And he then tells them, well, the word is the seed, and uh, the sower is probably Jesus, and he comes and he sows, and, and then it falls on, on, on the hard-trodden path. And, and so he goes on to explain to them uh, what the parable actually means. But it is dangerous and wrong for us to look for a one-to-one -one comparison between every word or concept used in the parable with a modern-day concept or interpretation. A typical example would be, um, uh, and you may have heard about the ten virgins. Um, some of them were wise and some of them were foolish, and they were waiting for the bridegroom, and some of them ran out of oil and their lamps didn't burn anymore. Now, you may then start interpreting every single thing there. What, what is the interpretation of a virgin? Um, we, we all have to be virgins in order to wait for Jesus. Um, what, what's the interpretation of the lamp? Well, uh, maybe my life needs to shine. What's the interpretation of the oil? Well, oftentimes in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is equated with oil, so it must be the Holy Spirit. So some of them ran out of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so you can become ridiculous in your interpretation of a parable. And when the, when the parable is not interpreted for us like the parable of the sower, which is the case for most of the parables, they are not interpreted, then we have to rely on what has become known as the one single truth in the parable. And in the case that I just mentioned, the, the five wise and five foolish virgins, the issue there is readiness for the coming of the Messiah. That is the focus of the parable. We do not have to worry about every single little detail because the story tells one truth. The truth is that we need to be ready when Jesus comes back. And there are many ways in which we can be ready. Uh, but, but we need to be very careful to try and make, not to try and make a one-on-one -on -one comparison between every aspect of the parable and some modern-day uh, interpretation. The word context, when I'm speaking or teaching at a theological college, this is the one thing that I say to the students. Context, context, context. Rule number one is context. Rule number two is context. Rule number three is context. What is the context? I have used the illustration of um, uh, you are a real pumpkin. I, I think you will remember that a, a few weeks ago. And, and, and every time I explain to you the context, the exact same wording takes on a different meaning. And so the context is important. Now, we do not have someone like Paul or Moses or Jeremiah to come and explain to us the context, and therefore we depend on the context in the Scripture itself. The immediate and the broader written context is important, so we don't take any passage out of context. It's important. The language used, the meaning of the words, the writing techniques, and sometimes techniques are there and they need to be interpreted to understand the, fl the flow of thought, the culture and the cultural expressions in there, the historical background or the backdrop of an event is important, the setting of the story may help us to understand the message. All of those things create context for us. And so we, we, we normally don't take a passage out of its context and, and uh, put it up somewhere and say we've got to live by this. We need to read the previous section. We need to read what is following. We also need to understand if we're reading in the book of Revelation, there is the context of apocalyptic material. When you read in the book of Proverbs, there is the context of proverbial sayings or wise sayings. And, and the list goes on and on and on. So genre also determines something of the context. Now, you have heard probably... And uh, let, me, let me go to Luke chapter 9 by way of example. Luke chapter 9, verse 27. And I would like to challenge you uh, to give me the interpretation of this. Jesus says, he's talking to them about after, Jesus con uh, after Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ and so on. Um, and, and Jesus says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses it, his life for me will save it. Um, and he goes on in verse... Uh, 26, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. 
What is the meaning of that? I've heard several different interpretations, such as, well, some standing here, um, it, it must refer to the generation around the second coming of Jesus. And they will not die until they have actually seen the coming of Jesus. I'm, I'm not sure that Jesus is saying that. It's obviously some kind of a context about, uh, there is something in the context about the second coming, and, and Jesus proclaiming uh, or not being ashamed of, of those people and so on. So what's the meaning of some who are standing here, and Jesus talking to his disciples, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. So what's the meaning? Well, I personally believe um, that the answer is in the immediate context. Um, if you turn to Matthew 16, 28 and Mark chapter 9, verse 1, I'm not going to turn there right now, but the same story is repeated in the same saying, the exact same statement we find in all three of the synoptic Gospels as they have become known. And in Luke chapter 9, verse 28, listen to the wording. About eight days after Jesus said this, He took Peter, John and James with Him and went up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. His clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. Every single one of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew 16 and Mark chapter 9, follow the exact same saying with the exact same story, and that is the transfiguration on the mountain. In other words, Jesus was saying, some of those, Peter, John, and um, Peter, John, and James, those three he was referring to, they will see me in my glory. And when they saw Jesus change completely, I mean, he was just a human being with him, with them all the time. Now suddenly they see him change. His clothes even changed. And suddenly there is Elijah and Moses. And so they must have had a glimpse of glory right there on that mountain. And so Jesus was actually preparing them and saying that they are going to see the glory of Jesus. Now, if you look a little bit further, perhaps, um, maybe there's some reference to the second coming, but I actually don't see the second coming in the context following immediately. That is how important context is. The background of a passage is the principle number five. The historical background, the historical unfolding of God's plan in the Bible provides some important clues for exegesis and application. We've got to read the Bible against the whole background of the Bible. You don't ever take a passage uh, of Scripture and, and make an application without understanding the unfolding of God's plan. Uh, I told you before, if you hang around to the, to the last module, um, there's a concept that I will introduce there and explain and expand on. We call it progressive revelation. And that is God did not tell David in Kings and Samuel everything that is going to happen in the future. There are certain things that we now look back and we can see in the Psalms and others where prophetically there's a reference to Jesus, but it's not, it's not specific. As time progressed, God revealed more and more and more about Himself. And therefore, when we get to the New Testament... You need, it, you need to read it against the background of the Old Testament development of God's salvation plan. When you read in the Old Testament, you need to bear in mind that somewhere in the future, the New Testament is following, so we can't just remain in the Old Testament either. And all of that forms part of the background of the whole story. There is cultural background. The, the human authors of the Bible were steeped in their own culture. We, we talked about this on several occasions. They, they had a particular worldview. Um, for them, for example, uh, heaven had, th had three levels, if you wish. There was heaven as in the blue sky that we see. Uh, there was heaven where the stars reign. And there was heaven where God is. So there were three levels of heaven. Now, with our scientific knowledge today, we know about all of the universe and, and uh, the, the billions and billions of stars in every galaxy and everything else, which they never understood much. Uh, because they were limited in their understanding, their scientific knowledge at that particular time. Understanding these backgrounds will help us interpret what they have written and why a particular event has taken place. Again, by way of a very quick example, and only a few of them, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8 mentions divorce. And uh, you will know by now how to find Jeremiah, because you have memorized the books of the Bible. <clears throat> 
And Jeremiah says, during the reign of King Josiah, important historical background, Josiah reigned in the 7th century B.C. During the reign of King Josiah, the Lord said to me, Have you seen what faithless Israel has done? She has gone up on every hill and under every spreading tree and has committed adultery there. I thought that after she had done all this, she would return to me, but she did not, and her unfaithful sister Judah saw it. I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. God talking about uh, to Jeremiah about normal divorce between a man and a woman? Well, it's a picture which is a reality and divorce happened in those days. But in this particular case, the background is very clear. And that is, Judah was still in existence. If you know, if you know our timeline now, um, we, we now have Israel already gone. And God says, I have divorced her. And really he is meaning that the Assyrians came in 722 and they destroyed and they took over Samaria. And so that's part of the background. And now he's talking about her sister Judah, which is the southern kingdom. And unless they they careful, God is going to do come and do the same. So against the background of the divided kingdom and the fall of Samaria, uh, it is clear that, that God is talking figuratively about God divorcing Israel. Now the book of Ruth is full of references that can only be understood. In fact, some of them are actually in, explained in the book of Ruth sort of giving the indication that there was a following generation or generations who did not even understand what was going on in the book of Ruth. There are a couple of things there about leveret marriage, for example, and that is when, when a, a, a brother, an older brother, has a wife and he dies without having any children. In those days, part of the background, it was important to have a son because in your son, the name of the family will exist into the future generations. And so if that is not the case, then the rule was, or the law was, the second son needs to step in and, and make a baby. Um, and, and that baby will, will have the family name and will actually be seen as the older brother's child. And unless you understand that, you don't understand the book of Ruth, where Ruth uh, was the, the wife of one of the sons of Naomi, and he died, no children, and then someone had right or responsibility, not right, but right, responsibility to take Ruth in as a wife and then to create a family name uh, for that particular son. So that was all part of the background. Kingsman Redeemer, and that is this person, this family person. It, it's either a younger brother, and if there's no other sibling, as, as was the case in Ruth, um, th there needs to be another family member. Boaz happened to be a family member somehow related to the family of Ruth, of Naomi. And, and when he realized that, that he actually likes Ruth and he would like to take her in, he also said to Ruth, there's another person who is closer related to you, and therefore I need to first go and talk to him. Again, part of the background. Where does he go to? To the city gate. It's interesting, when you visit Israel... You, um, you will visit some places where they show you the ruins of city gates. And, and sometimes they are literally double gates. And with, between the first gate and the second gate, there's a, a huge area where the elders of the city, the old people or the wise people of the city gathered. That was the courtroom. This is where contracts were signed, if you wish. This is where people agreed on a particular issue. In the hearing of the elders, the elders confirmed it. And once that is confirmed, it's contractual. Uh, you are bound by that contract. Another thing, and this is actually explained in the book of Ruth. When Boaz talked to this other person, he said to him, um, you know what, uh, Ruth and her property, uh, or the property of Naomi, uh, belongs to you. Uh, you have first right to the property. And he said, okay, I'll take it. Then Boaz very cleverly said to him, well, if you take the property, you're also going to get Ruth. And the man said, no, that will, that will endanger my own family and situation. So I won't take it. And Boaz said, okay, so therefore I can take it. And the man said, yes, you can. And what did they do? They exchanged shoes. You take my shoe and I take mine. Don't fall asleep right now. But um, they exchanged shoes in front of the elders. They did. 
And that was part of a contract. Your shoe in my possession and the elders hearing all of this is contract signing and it was binding. And so Boaz was then able to marry Ruth and also inherit the property that uh, was going down to Ruth as well. Principle number six, scripture interprets scripture. Statements that occur only once as well as difficult references can only be understood against the truth of the whole of the Bible. The Chicago statement says uh, very firmly, the unity, the harmony, and the consistency of Scripture, we affirm and declare that it is its own best interpreter. Uh, we talked about the Chicago statement of faith uh, last week. But we never build a doctrine on a single reference in the Bible. We try to get an overall picture. There are references in the Bible where people have actually taken it and they have developed a whole cult around one single thing. Not long ago, in Cape Town, there was a woman. She broke away from a certain church. She started her own church with a, a, a bunch of elders. She broke away again from that particular church. And then she started a movement based on, I think it's 2 Corinthians 7 or 1, 1 Corinthians 7. But there's a statement about um, you, uh, you, you should live because of the times that we, we should live as if you're not married, uh, if you're a slave, don't, don't seek to change your situation or something like that. And she started teaching the people in her congregation that they should separate. Men and women, uh, husbands and wives should separate um, and, and they should not live together and so on. And she started a whole movement. And it, I mean, I'm talking about just a few years ago and I'm not sure whether she is still going. But one single reference which she has taken completely out of context, not bearing in mind the rest of the teachings of Scripture. Now, let me give you another example, and this is a historical example. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29. A very, very difficult passage, but in 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to remember uh, any uh, chapter in the Bible, this one is about the resurrection uh, of not only Christ, but also the resurrection of the believers. And in verse 29, Paul says this. Now, if there is no resurrection... What will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? Now this is one of those, it, it seems clear what Paul is saying, but we don't understand what he meant. And that's the difficulty with that. The Mormon church actually builds a doctrine around this one single reference in the Bible, and that is they baptize on behalf of the dead. Uh, I was um, interested once, I was, I was teaching in, in Parktown at the time and um, driving past a new building that was going up, I learned that it was the uh, Mormon temple, I think the only one in Africa at the time, I'm not sure whether in the meantime they have built another one. But in Parktown near the hospital there is a Mormon temple and uh, they were just completing it and they had sort of open house and you could go in and, and look at it. And I was very, very fascinated and interested going on the little tour. I stopped and I went through the building on a tour just out of curiosity. And I was very fascinated to see a huge bath held up by 12 oxen, an Old Testament image uh, that they use, but a big uh, bath that they fill with water. And by arrangement, I can then go, and if I think that my mother may not be a Christian or she died and she has not been a Christian or she's never been baptized, then I can make arrangements and I will then be baptized on her behalf. That can only happen in the temple, not in the normal Mormon churches. But there's a whole doctrine built on this one single reference. The problem with that is that the rest of Scripture does not refer to this at all. Um, there's not even any allusion to that anywhere in the Scriptures. And from the context, it seems like Paul is using an illustration to help people understand resurrection, not baptism. He wasn't teaching about baptism. He was teaching about the resurrection. And he said if uh, even maybe a wrong practice, maybe, maybe people did do it in those days, but it may have been a wrong practice. But Paul uses that as an illustration to point out how we must believe in the resurrection. Let me give you some conclusions. When you study a passage of Scripture... Take care in your study of the Word. Be careful, in other words. Don't be in too much of a hurry to come to a final conclusion. Look for the clear meaning of the text, if it is at all possible. Study the context, the language, the culture, the worldview, the rest of Scripture, by the way. 
check your interpretation with others. Your pastor, read some commentaries and make sure that your interpretation is supported by others. And then continually pray for the Holy Spirit's guidance and that illumination that will come your way uh, if you are praying and, and uh, depending on the Holy Spirit. Chicago Statement on Biblical Hermeneutics, article number 15 says, We affirm the necessity of interpreting the Bible according to its literal or normal sense. The literal sense is the grammatical historical sense, that is, the meaning which the writer expressed. Interpretation according to the literal sense will take account of all figures of speech and literary forms found in the text. I uh, called it the genre. Uh, that you will be looking at. Now, this brings us to the close of module number one. I trust that you have enjoyed it and that the Bible will become um, very alive to you. In terms of the future, um, we are starting module number two pretty soon, and that's going to be a survey of the Old Testament, and we'll take a book-by-book -book look at every single uh, book in the Old Testament. We deal with the author, a brief background, the genre, the outline, the main message of every book in the Old Testament. And uh, if you can pre-register, it would really help us to know how many of you are coming. May God bless you um, and enjoy your Bible.